cutscenes play an important role in video games. They convey vital story information, develop characters, and most importantly, give you a chance to go and make a cup of tea. I joke, of course, cutscenes are important and you should obviously pay attention to them, but sometimes the temptation to mess around with the game's carefully constructed storytelling is too great. Here are seven ways we've devised to keep ourselves amused during long cutscenes. Enjoy and beware spoilers for the following games. Scenes in GoldenEye for the N64 were mostly short little scene setters at the start and end of levels to give you a little bit of flavour. Showing Bond swinging his gun around, or blowing something up, or swinging his gun around. It's mostly those two things. However, as short as they may be, that doesn't mean that they're not still ripe for messing with, and the fact that they all take place in-engine means that you can use explosives to totally disrupt what's supposed to happen. For example, here in the Sevenaya installation in Siberia, we have a cutscene with Bond being captured. Chuck a mine before triggering the cutscene, and it plays out a lot differently. <laughs> Running out of patience with Natalia? Once again, explosives can change the cutscene of the two of you leaving the bunker from this... ...to this. And really, Mishkin and his cronies arresting you here in St. Petersburg should probably keep an eye on all these explosives you're tossing around. More like James Bond, am I right? I am right. The Devil May Cry series is known for spectacular hack and slash action, achingly stylish characters, and one of the weirdest line reads in history. I should have been the one to fill your dark soul with light. That was the take? I guess the director of the voiceover session had somewhere else to be that day. It is at least in keeping with the fact that everything in the Devil May Cry series is fabulously over the top compared to pretty much every other video game franchise out there, not least the cutscenes. Just look at this one from Devil May Cry 4 where Nero revs up his sword like a motorcycle and then rides around on top of a corpse. You don't get that in The Last of Us. Everyone's too sad about the world ending or whatever. Some of the cutscenes in DMC4 go on for absolutely ages, such as the opening scene of the game where the two main characters engage in beautifully choreographed combat as you, the player, watch on enviously. Oh, I can't wait to be doing that myself. Any moment now. Then, after almost nine whole minutes, it's finally your turn. Not quite the same, is it? Developer Capcom appears at least somewhat mindful of this, in that it decided the player probably needed something to do during these lengthy cutscenes. As a result, they added in the option to twiddle the white analog stick for some limited camera movement and squeeze the trigger to zoom in and out a bit. Wow, you're really spoiling us. Presumably, this was designed to allow you to focus in on small details in the scenes, but everything happened so rapidly, we mainly found ourselves using it for looking up people's noses, zooming in on Nero's butt, and inspecting this guy's weird little beard. You stole him until then! How does he achieve that shape? I think the only explanation is that his chin looks like that underneath. 
If you're particularly impatient and frantic on the controls, you can actually render some of the most lavishly action-packed cutscenes in gaming history almost completely unwatchable. At least it's not ruined by the voice acting this time. You got a jacked up notion of fair play, pal. And it's beginning to piss me off. A plus performance. No notes. It took just 24 hours for us to lose control of the city. Tonight, Gotham's relying on one man to save us all. Being the billionaire owner of a tech company means that Batman has access to all kinds of amazing gadgets that he can use for a variety of crime-fighting purposes. There are the Batarangs, which he can use to smash criminals unconscious. The Batclaw, which he can use to smash criminals unconscious. And of course, the Batmobile, which... Don't worry, he ain't catching us! Oh god, what's he doing? What's he doing? Okay, these are mostly for smashing criminals unconscious, if I'm honest. One gadget that isn't used for caving in desperate people's skulls, however, is the holographic projector that Bats has built into the wrist of his Batsuit. Oracle. I need the location of Unit 247. Already working on it. This handy communicator lets him chat away to Oracle and see her in real time without him having to do anything as gauche as fish a cell phone out of his pocket. I mean, for one thing, it would ruin the line of his bat trousers. These conversations with Oracle are full of useful info on what to do next, but if you're anything like us, you'll be less interested in listening to what Oracle has to say and more interested in rotating the camera and perfectly lining up Oracle's face with Batman's face so it looks like Oracle is Batman. Cowl, ears, and all. Full chemical breakdown on the back computer. Yes! Nailed it! Sorry, what was that? Something about Scarecrow? Destroying the city? I'm sorry, I wasn't listening. The ship's dead in the water. The whole island's gone to hell. If there was ever a game series that didn't need much in the way of plot, it's Dead Island. You're on an island, everyone's dead, hit them with sticks until they fall over. I think that pretty much covers it. Yeah. However, there are still non-player characters in games like 2011 spin-off Dead Island Riptide who will insist on trying to tell you about the plot and who you'll need to listen to before the game will allow you to go back to caving zombie heads in. I'm back. Oh, Jesus. I thought we were goners. Where the hell did you come from? Of course, the other main selling point of Dead Island is the fact that you can play it with up to three other players in co-op. As a result, if you've got other players joining you in your game whenever you're enduring some unskippable story, they are free to start kicking the shit out of the quest giver's furniture. <laughs> Will you give us the map now? You're wasting too much time. They're also free to wander into shot brandishing a flaming shillelagh and start trying to kick that quest giver in the back. Fortunately, there are so many factors to consider that it is impossible for me to tell you exactly <laughs> what really I have. But one thing is clear. You should avoid anything that would put you at risk. I really hope he wasn't talking about a zombie cure, because I didn't get a word of that. Also, I've killed a lot of those zombies, so that's going to be an awkward conversation. I cannot tell you who you must become. Or where the line is drawn. There are no easy choices. Cal Kestis, the playable character in Star Wars Jedi Survivor, is that rarest of things. A Jedi who actually survived Order 66. Well, I suppose there was Yoda, and Obi-Wan, and Grogu, and Ahsoka Tano, and Kelleran Beck, Caleb Doom, oh, and Luminara Unduli. But that's definitely it, apart from Seer Junda. But that is definitely it. Don't at me. Eno Cordova. All right, fine, you can barely move for Jedi who survived Order 66, but that doesn't mean that Cal's story is any less impactful as he struggles to survive in a hostile galaxy in which Jedi are hunted and the Order is on the brink of being wiped out completely. If there is any hope of surviving, we must stand against the darkness. That being said, as we've touched on on this channel, Jedi Survivor also lets you customize Cal to create new looks that range from typical Jedi robes and haircuts to the nastiest, skeeviest, perviest little mustache you can possibly imagine. The great thing about this is that you can customize Cal at any time, even during cutscenes, and his appearance will change instantly. So, say for example, a cutscene is starting to drag a little. I'd assume the first time we met you'd be strapped to an interrogation chair. I've heard that before. You can just pop open the customization menu, dress Cal in the worst combination of clothes and hair you can imagine, and then struggle to take the rest of the cutscene seriously as it plays out with you looking like this. Still weird. 
Get on the comms and call off the base alert. Or what? You're a Jedi. I know what you are capable of. Order 66 starting to make a lot more sense now. Not gonna lie. <laughs> Here, let me buy you a drink. Oh, and by the way, nice to finally meet you. In the Half-Life series of games, your player character Gordon Freeman is a highly respected scientist who is a graduate from MIT. I don't know how you can say that, although I will admit that the possibility of a resonance cascade scenario is extremely unlikely. Gordon doesn't need to hear all this. He's a highly trained professional. Whereas I went to what I like to call the University of Life, and still somehow managed to flunk the first year. More fool Valve, then, for putting me in charge of the camera during the cutscenes in Half-Life 2. Probably, were Gordon in control, he'd be concentrating on absorbing every detail about the potentially hazardous teleportation experiment that's about to take place in Dr. Kleiner's lab. We'll inaugurate the new teleport with a double transmission. You mean it's working? For real this time? Because I still have nightmares about that cat. No, no, there's nothing to be nervous about. What cat? We've made major strides since then. Major strike. What cat? Well, it seems like all this is in hand. That leaves me to ignore all the important exposition explaining how the teleporter works, and instead trying to balance books on people's heads. I've made a few modifications, but I'll just acquaint you with the essentials. Prodding the little plastic hula girl on the desk. Meanwhile, let's get this show on the road. And fooling around with the miniature version of the teleportation machine and making books explode out of it. No. What? Maybe I learn by doing. Probably if we'd been listening to what Dr. Kleiner was saying, when the moment came to actually teleport ourselves across the countryside surrounding City 17 and things began to go catastrophically wrong, we might have actually been able to do something clever to help. What's going on, Judith? I'm not sure. It seems to be some kind of interference. Gordon, take we'll get you out of there. Something is drawing him away. But hey, look at it this way. If I had intervened to help and been instantly teleported across to Eli Vance's outpost, then Half-Life 2 would have been a much shorter and less interesting game. So really, I did us all a favour. Certainly not. Never fear, Gordon. She's debeaked. Just a little bit of wisdom I picked up in what I like to call the Community College of Life. There must be another way. This one need not die. <laughs> An excellent kill. Fortune favours your blade. Like the iPhone, hashtags, and the subprime mortgage crisis, the original Assassin's Creed is 16 years old this year, and it too, in its own way, changed the world forever. I never looked at a haystack the same way again. And because this is such an ancient game, one might forget that the original Assassin's Creed protagonist Altair was what one might describe as a total asshole. Nothing is true. Everything is permitted. Understand these words. It matters not how we complete our task. Only that it's done. But this is not the way I'm- My way is better. At least in the early stages of the game, Altair, the OG assassin, is arrogant, cold, and when I'm playing him, constantly body-checking people in the street. I'm a consummate role player. Altair's arrogance makes it all the more fitting, in my mind, that during the sequences in this game where the camera is locked off for a cutscene, Altair is free to roam around within the confines of the scene while another character talks at him. Altair, you've returned. Raouf, it is good to see you unharmed. I trust your mission was a success. Is the master in his tower? You can't stab anything or climb anything, but you can march moodily back and forth or turn your back rudely on the speaker, especially suitable when it's your revered mentor Al Mualim giving you a telling off for being a total asshole. I send you, my best man, to complete a mission more important than any that has come before. And you return to me with nothing but apologies and excuses. I did. Do not speak. Happily, this feature also lets you walk in small circles throughout dramatic cutscenes, adding a much appreciated interactive dimension to the Assassin's Creed storytelling. Bring forth the hostage! And occasionally, if you manage to kite some enemies into a cutscene, it adds a much less appreciated interactive dimension, where you get an unanswerable ass beating while Al Mualim watches on impassively. Altair. Master. Ah! Forward. 
Tell me of your mission. And since this is all taking place within the simulation of genetic memories from modern-day Altair lookalike Desmond Miles, we have to infer that this is how it all really happened. And you returned to me with nothing but apologies and excuses. I did. Do not speak. Not another word. This is a genetic memory I'd rather forget, if I'm honest. We'll need to mount another course. I swear. No. You do nothing. Thank you so much for watching this video. We hope it was amusing enough that you didn't feel the need to run around in small circles or completely change your outfit during it just to keep yourself entertained. Um, if that is the case and you were able to avoid that, uh, then we have two more videos, one up here about rubbish vehicles that were so bad we'd rather walk, and one down here from our sister channel, Outside Extra, about video game announcers who didn't need to go that hard. Yeah, really unnecessary. Anyway, enjoy those, and we'll see you on the next one. Bye.